Hello and welcome back to Miss Hulse YouTube channel. Welcome to the second video of a series of videos about the Elastic Launch Glider event of the Science Olympiad. In this video, we're going to be covering the basics uh, surrounding the Elastic Launch Glider, some of the aspects of it, the rules, the regulations, and some vocabulary that you definitely need to know when going for further. As always, I am available for further inquiries, suggestions, or tips at holholst at gmail.com, and I look forward to hearing from you guys. As I've said before, I'm learning right along with you guys. From what I have learned uh, about this event, there are four primary aspects. There's the design of the glider, construction of the glider, launch of the glider, and completed logbook. The first part, the design of the glider, it can be an original design that students come up with, or you can purchase a kit, as I did, available tons of places online. On the Science Olympiad, there are links to gliders that they endorse. I chose to go with the Freedom Flight model, which is pictured here on the right. Now, important to note is even though you're making a kit that's already been pre-made for you, you're still going to be making a ton of personalizations and alterations, and that flows into the construction of the glider. So there are definitely some things that you'll get to choose on your own, although the wings have templates made available for you. You're still going to be able to choose how much you want your wings to weigh, um, some of the shapes of it. You'll also be able to choose the size um, of sanding for the fuselage, You'll be able to decide where you want your rudder to be, things like that. So don't feel like you're taking um, a lesser road by making your model from a kit. It's, it's definitely still a challenge. For me, personally, it took about six hours to make my first one. When I made my second model, it took about four hours, so not as long. One thing that I recommend is making... Um, additional additional purchases for making um, additional wings. So the wings are pretty pretty fragile and there's so much room for changing the wings, especially with the aileron, the dimensions that it's it's pretty easy if you just change the wings often rather than the whole body. We'll get into that a little bit later. The next part is the launch of the glider. So not only is there the primary launch that happens during competition, your official launch, you're also going to be launching your glider when you practice. And so this is where the completed logbook comes into play. When you are practicing, make sure, and this is required, for you to record the, the height, flight time, things like that, different aspects of the room possibly. So you may be pra practicing in a gymnasium or other associated large area, um, but your dimensions are probably going to be different from the dimensions that you compete in. So when the, the dimensions of the room are announced, you can compare um, the dimensions of different places that you have, you have launched your glider in, and you can start to derive some information from that. So four aspects, all of it is um, going to be completed mostly during the, the practice before the competition, but all are absolutely crucial during the competition. The next part that I want to discuss with you guys is the parts of the glider, and this is absolutely important. Um, for me, when I was reading through the rules and tips and things like that online, I was lost until I finally got this information down. So just to point out before I go any further, the picture I have here is from SciOlly.org, and I saw it a lot of other places on the AMA website, things like that. Obviously, this is not what your glider is going to look like. You won't have an engine or propeller, and unfortunately, you won't have landing gear. However, there are some main things that you're going to see here and familiarities, and I use this picture just so you're familiar with it. So anyway, the first thing that you're going to notice and probably be most familiar with is the wing of the glider, which has the largest surface area, most noticeable part of the glider. Um... 
The next part is the aileron, which is a part of the, the wing that is the back edge wing of a glider, which is closest to the tail. So here you can see at the back edge, and you might have been um, familiar with this when on an airplane, when you're waiting to load the ailerons that are adjustable, yours are also equally adjustable. So um, this will help create drag, things like that, which we will get into later. Um, but the aileron, very important and adjustable to you, great for customization. The next part is the fuselage or the fuse, and that's just the main body of the glider. That's a part that during your soft and hard launches, you're going to be holding on to different um, parts of that for your launch. The next part is the stabilizer, also referred to as the stab. For the layperson, simply the tail. So this refers to the entire tail of the glider, but it is broken down into two important parts. So the rudder going up and down is a vertical stabilizer um, and perpendicular to that is the elevator which is a horizontal stabilizer. Very important for your glider. We'll get into that in the next couple videos and we will investigate why they are so important. Now for the construction rules and regulations. Now when you're first handed your packet for the rules and regulations that the Science Olympiad gives you. It seems like it's a lot of information. However, now that you know a little bit about the parts, it's really, it's pretty straightforward for you guys. So the first part is you cannot use pre-glued joints or pre-covered surfaces um, already from a kit. So not only can you not buy a pre-made elastic launch glider online, there can't be any pre-glued joints like possibly with the wing or there there can't be any pre-covered surfaces, perhaps um, paint, some kind of lacquer. Um, it's all going to be for you to uh, customize. Second part, very important and very straightforward, no metal. There's going to be no metal on your your launcher, on the glider, anything like that. So the glider weight, and this is um, one of the great changes that you can make to your glider, is the glider weight is anywhere between 4 and 10 grams, which is such a huge difference. I ended up making um, two gliders, and my first one was barely above 4 grams. The second one was about 9.5, and I couldn't believe the differences in in the launches. It was It was pretty incredible, and a lot of strategy behind that, which we'll get into so glider weight between 4 and 10 grams. The glider wingspan is not to exceed 32 centimeters. And this is really important. So absolutely measure, measure again, remeasure, and just measure one more time. Because after you put so much time into it, you really don't want to get it wrong. Um, other important part is the glider length must be over 32 centimeters. So 32 centimeters is a key here. So the wingspan from wing to wing tip cannot be over 32 centimeters. However, the glider length from fuselage to fuselage needs to be over 32 centimeters. Pretty straightforward, but don't don't get counted off for scoring just because you made this simple mistake. Make sure to remeasure. This next part about the fuselage was pretty confusing to me, um, so I'll definitely explain that. In the rule manual, there's the picture here about the legal and illegal. Now, this is referencing the fuselage and how it could or could not fit into a chapstick lid. So, the chapstick lid is indicated by the U-shaped bold um, line here. And the fuselage is trying to fit into that, that chapstick cap. Now, just a reminder, if you forgot what the fuselage is, that is the third picture closest to the right edge of the screen. Um, so it's that the first part that you encounter when looking at the, fu at the glider, and it should be kind of thick and rounded. And now in this part, you're going to be putting clay in there, um, which helps to balance out the, the center of gravity of the entire glider. So pretty straightforward after you understand it from there. The fuselage has to be more than 1.57 centimeters deep and over 
three seven centimeters wide. So it's legal if it does not fit into a chapstick lid and it is illegal if it does. So for me, I didn't have any problems with that. Um, didn't do too much sanding around that part, but just make sure it doesn't fit. Um, so the glider's launch handle needs to be less than one meter. Now, when it comes with the kit, it's definitely not going to be over one meter for most kits, I should say. Um, and then if anything, it's going to get smaller based on sanding techniques that you might want to do for the launcher. Um, this next part, the glider's elastic launcher is non-metallic. Again, that goes with no metal, but it bears repeating. Now, keep in mind, guys, that there will be an official inspection upon um, competition day, and any any uh, um, failure to meet the rules and regulations, you guys are going to get docked points on that, and I definitely don't want to see that. So you'll still be able to compete, luckily. However, you you will be pretty severely affected in scoring. Now for the competition rules and regulations. So, as you may already know, this is an indoor event, and the great thing is the room dimensions, the length, the width, the height, are going to be announced before competition. So, this could be anywhere from 30 minutes to 24 hours to 7 days before competition. Um, that, that changes, and I'm assuming the change is pretty great state by state. But they do announce that, but you just don't know when. So... Um, the great thing about the logbook is if you've kept a neat and tidy log logbook, you'll be able to reference back to that um, to see maybe how the competition space will be different from the place that you've been practicing. So each team comprising of two members is able to bring two gliders. So for me, I would probably bring my two different size glider, the 4 gram glider and the 10 gram, well, not over 10 gram glider. I would bring both of those. You also can bring multiple launch handles or just one. The, your flight logs, eyewear, and any additional tools. So make sure to bring those additional tools in case for some reason you have catastrophe that strikes during your launches. You do have a little bit of time to make any, um, any repairs. Um, like I said previously, eye protections at all time during competition. So if you fail to meet the regulations for size or perhaps your log books are incomplete, that you can, can, can recover from. However, if you don't have proper eyewear, you cannot compete. No ifs, ands, or buts. Perhaps if there's time, um, the timers will be nice enough to let you borrow a pair if there is a pair of glasses for you and your partner to to borrow, but that that's not a given. So always bring your eyeglasses or your eye protection. Um, more about this completed logbook, which you will be bringing. There are four required parameters. Now three are assigned to you, and the three that are assigned to you are the estimated, recorded, um, peak height flight after launch, the approximate length of elastic flight time, and then you have a requir required choice parameter. So two that I've seen that are pretty popular in my research was the launch angle and the orbit diameter. However, you can, this is up to you, whatever you feel like um, is relevant to you and your partner's uh, success. So for the event competition, the teams have five minutes to complete the five official flights. So in the five minutes, you have time to complete your five official flights. However, five minutes is a lot, and um, you probably won't fill all of that time with just your official flights. So the great thing about the Science Olympiad is they also allow you to fill that time with trim flights. So if this space is totally new to you, which it very likely is, you can do a couple trial trial flights to to figure out what the best methodology would be. Now, the important thing to remember is that when you're launching the glider, you have to tell the timers if it's a trim flight or if it's an official flight. If you don't announce it, they're just going to have to assume that it's an official flight and it will be recorded. 
in this five minutes, like I said earlier, not only do you have time for official flights, for trim flights, but you also have time for repairs that that may unfortunately happen. Um, so for the timers, you're going to have three timers during the competition. Now, the important thing to note here is the average of times is not used. However, the middle time is used of the three timers. Um, so for scoring, the sum of the three longest official flights is used. So your longest flight time is not used. It's the sum of three. And that's what's going to be compared to your peers. Um, for scoring, also, incomplete flight logs, 10% off score, so perhaps you only had the three required parameters and you forgot to do your required choice parameter. No problem, not the end of the world, 10% off your score, however, you will be docked for that. Now, for no flight logs, that's 30% off your score. Again, nothing you can't still succeed with, um, however, it will be a little harder, so if you forgot it at home, not the end of the world, you can still go out there and try to win. For construction or competition violations, you will be ranked below all competitors who did meet the standards. So, if you're competing against five teams and for some reason your wingspan is over 32 centimeters, if um, if they were all correct, you're going to automatically be ranked fifth, even if your flight times were um, were better than theirs. So. You can still have the opportunity to be competitive, but you will be ranked below the other competitors. Now, this last part is interesting because ties are broken by the longest official non-scored flight. So, like I said, your your um, your score is the sum of the three longest official flights. So, so are your peers. So, the fourth flight which would be the fourth longest, that is what's going to be the tiebreaker for you. So all of your flights matter. Definitely go in there and give every flight your best your best chance and definitely use the trim time, especially since you have time for it. Like I said earlier um, in the first PowerPoint, this all these events align with NGSS. So absolutely wonderful. So here you have the MSPS2 Motion and Stability Forces and Interaction Standard, which deals with Newton's Third Law. You also have MSETS1 Engineering Design, and you also have five Science and Engineering Practices, and these are so relevant and what, what I've found. So developing and using models, not only can you develop your model, but learning how to use your model. So even if you bought the kit, you have to learn how to use the kit and make it into something actually worthwhile. Planning and carrying out vet investigations, absolutely using the logbooks, what worked, what didn't work, changing. Analyzing and interpreting data, again, the logbook. Using mathematics and computational thinking. construction, Constructing explanations, and that's the portion of science, and designing solutions, and that's engineering. So... Like I've said before, maybe it should be a science Olympiad, maybe it should be STEM Olympiad. Tons of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in there. Anyway, that's a wrap for the Elastic Launch Slider, the basics video. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. And again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please email me at holst at gmail.com.